the indicated we will I will talk about uh, central receiver systems and parabolic dishes both of them are point focused technologies uh, the time we, we have is uh, quite short for such uh, for described in depth these technologies but uh, I will try to give an overview and uh, perhaps if you have questions you can address them to me later or even if you wish some more information I could uh, I could try to to make it uh, available to you. <coughs> well, um, okay. We will start with uh, central receiver systems. Uh, <coughs> central receiver systems are one of the main point focus technologies. There are not only two; there are some more. But uh, at the moment, central receiver systems and parabolic dishes have been successful somehow. And uh, <coughs> well, central receiver systems. Uh, we can we could say that the, these technologies, central receiver systems or CRS, uh, is in a more advanced stage of uh, development at, at the moment. In fact, the first commercial plant built in Spain uh, was PS10, which uh, you can see in the big picture uh, during construction, which is a uh, It's a power tower system of uh, 10 megawatts, 11 megawatts uh, rated power with a large heliostat field and uh, a water steam uh, receiver. I will comment on, on it later. The other picture you can see in the, on the screen is uh, the Barstow plant. Uh, this plant was built in the early 80s of the last uh, century and uh, it was a 10 megawatt plant which was in operation during nearly 20 years uh, with different uh, experiments going on in there in these installations uh, it was a demonstration plant not a commercial plant the first com commercial central receiver system uh, was uh, yes time okay, let's go ahead I will just uh, remember this uh, <coughs> this block diagram, which I have commented in the other sessions. Uh, this is the basic configuration of a uh, solar thermal power plant, and of course, this is also the basic configuration of a CRS plant or power or tower plant. We have the concentrator to concentrate the solar the solar irradiance. The direct component of the solar radiance. The concentrated radiation goes to the receiver where it's converted to thermal energy, and the thermal energy <coughs> is uh, used in a power conversion system to generate uh, mechanical, mechanical power and uh, electricity. Finally, we can also have a <coughs> we can also have. Uh, two other systems in this uh, in this uh, can, we can see two other systems in this uh, drawing. We can see the thermal storage where we can deliver part of the thermal energy to make uh, to use it uh, later later when we have a need of uh, thermal energy and we don't we can get it from the from the solar radiation. And we can have an auxiliary boiler or a backup system, mm -hmm. uh, normally f mm, <coughs> normally fueled by a fossil fuel, or it could be also biomass or uh, fuels derived derived from biomass. In this drawing, from uh, <coughs> this drawing, we can see central receiver system without uh, these. Uh, last two systems I mentioned, that is without thermal storage and without uh, auxiliary or backup uh, fuel system. Uh, we can see the concentrator, the concentrator, uh, one moment, I don't know if the pointer works, 
uh, the concentrator is uh, made of a set of, uh, <coughs> of heliostats. These are uh, mirrors that, uh, <coughs> that concentrate, redirect and concentrate the solar radiation to move <laughs> well I will try to uh, yes the heliostats concentrate the solar radiation on the receiver which is placed on top of tower uh, the receiver the solar the concentrated solar radiation is converted is converted to <coughs> to thermal energy normally increasing temperature of a fluid or uh, <coughs> increasing the energy of this fluid can be an increase of temperature or it can be also a phase change for example an evaporation and uh, well the thermal energy is then uh, is then taken to power conversion system in this case steam turbine to generate electricity it's the basic uh, the basic uh, diagram of a central receiver system Uh, we will now talk a little bit about the concentrator. The concentrator, as I said, is made of a set of uh, individual mirrors of uh, heliostats. Uh, the heliostat is defined as an instrument consisting of a mirror mounted on an axis moved by a clockwork by which a sunbeam is steadily reflected in one direction. This is a very good definition of uh, the function of a heliostat. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it's not it's not uh, exactly uh, like a tracker like the trackers used in concentrating uh, or in PV in photovoltaics or even the concentrators that w that we use for dish stirling systems for parabolic dishes and stirling systems because uh, they have to to track the sun but uh, the position must be calculated so that the reflected ray hits the receiver. The heliostat uh, is made of a few basic components. These are the reflecting surface, normally mirrors, but it can also be any other type of reflecting surface, like the ones we mentioned uh, during the last session for, <coughs> for parabolic traps. Remember uh, acrylic films, silver acrylic films, or even aluminium uh, reflective surfaces at the moment most of them or I would say all of them in commercial plants or pre-commercial projects uh, are made of uh, glass mirrors then we have a structure and a tracking mechanism and finally a control system to make sure that uh, <coughs> the heliostat reflects the sun rays in the correct direction there are two basic uh, types of heliostats. Uh, one of them is the glass me metal heliostat. It's the traditional heliostat, I would say, and it's a uh, state of the art nowadays. And the other one is the stretched membrane, which uh, consists of a membrane mounted on a circular frame or ring. Uh, <laughs> and the uh, reflective surface is provided by reflective film or glass mirror attached to the front membrane. Uh, this, uh, um, this type of heliostats uh, were developed a few years ago. At the moment, they are not in the market, but uh, they could be an alternative in the future. Regarding the size, uh, most of the well, the trend since the since the beginning of uh, since the early stages of this technology has been to increase the size. The first heliostats in the first plants were in the first demonstration plants in the 70s or 80s of the uh, 20th century uh, were around 40 square meters in reflective surface and uh, the trend has been to increase the size. Now, for example, the heliostats have at uh, the two commercial plants in Spain are 120 square meters in reflective surface. But uh, since a few years ago, uh, there is uh, there are there's a new interest in small size heliostats, especially for modular concepts. We will mention them at the end of the presentation. 
Here we can see a drawing of uh, heliostat. Uh, this is a traditional, what I would call a traditional heliostat. The <coughs> concentrating the reflective surface is mounted on reflective surface is mounted. I, I'm trying to use the pointer, but uh, I don't know why I can't. I hope you can follow it uh, more or less. Well, as I said, the reflective surface is mounted on a structure. Normally, this structure is uh, made of a space frame mounted on the central tube, a torque tube, and uh, <coughs> and uh, this uh, structure is mounted on a pedestal. The azimuth and elevation drives are mounted on top of the pedestal and. Uh, Connected to the to the tube to the torque tube. Here you can see the function of the heliostat. We have the incident ray from the sun. We have the incident ray from the sun, and uh, and the the heliostat must be positioned so that the normal to the heliostat surface, to the constant to the reflective surface. Uh, <coughs> permits that the reflected ray hits the receiver. Here we can see a drawing of one of these traditional glass metal heliostats. In fact, this is the drawing of the Martí Marietta heliostat, which was used in the first demonstration plants like uh, Solar One in the United States, the one that we saw before in the picture, and the central receiver system at the of the International Energy Agency at Plataforma Solar de Almería in Spain. This uh, heliostat uh, was 40 square meters in reflective surface. It was made of uh, 12 facets or individual heliostats. Here you can see the facets. Uh, these facets were mounted on frame, mounted on a central tube, on the torque tube which in turn was mounted, which was connected to the azimuth and elevation drive mechanisms. The whole assembly was mounted on a pedestal. And uh, well, in this case, the control elements were placed, the, the electronics of the heliostat were placed in the pedestal. Of course, the pedestal has a foundation to, uh, that fixes. Uh, it to the ground. Here we can see, we will see some pictures of different heliostats. These are glass metal, metal heliostats. Uh, for example, this one is a picture of a heliostat, the National Solar Test Facility of San Diego National Labs, United States. Uh, this is a Martin Marietta heliostat, like the one we saw before in the drawing. Mm -hmm. Uh, solar 1 or solar 2 at Barstow. And here we can see one stretched membrane heliostat, which, uh, as I said, is, uh, <coughs> is uh, made of a membrane mounted on a circular frame or ring. And um, the, <coughs> the optical surface is achieved by means of a um, blower that makes some vacuum inside. Uh, Inside the in the space between the membrane and the ring, and uh, <coughs> and uh, this uh, what well, this gives a certain curvature to the surface that uh, that is the curvature needed to make it uh, to get the appropriate op optics. Here we can see the image produced by this heliostat on a test target a tower on the NSTF tower at San Diego National Labs in United States. Here we can see pictures of some more stretched membrane heliostats. The problem, the main problems with these heliostats uh, had to do with the, first of all, with the durability of uh, silver to clear films which uh, were used to provide the reflective surface. The main advantage, is, advantage of this uh, type of heliostats was the low weight. So 
so uh, if you use uh, mirrors, uh, you are losing part of the advantages. These uh, reflective films at the moment have not proven uh, there have not proven enough durability. Now it seems that there are new developments that might uh, change the situation, but when these heliostats were developed, the durability was not enough. Other problems had to do with the controllability of the, the shape of the, of the optical uh, surface due to the wind effects. Well, the heliostats are are the components of the concentrator of the concentrator of the concentrating system. In fact, this is a Fresnel uh, reflector. It's a point focus Fresnel reflector, and um, <coughs> these elements can be arranged different ways uh, <coughs> around the tower, around the focus. In fact, the main <coughs> arrangement are a surrounding field and a north or south field. Uh, it would be north if we are in the northern hemisphere, it would be a south field if we were in the southern hemisphere. <coughs> For example, we have here a north field. Uh, this, is, uh, well, this is the layout of the heliostats around the, the tower. The tower would be placed at the origin of this coordinate system and uh, the heliostats are arranged in rows uh, different ways so the, well, we will talk about it uh, later how to arrange the heliostats to get the best uh, possible performance of the field here we can see a picture of the CESA1 plant CES1 a1 plant at the Plataforma Solar de Almería. It uh, was a one megawatt uh, electric plant with thermal storage. You can see the storage tanks here at the bottom of the tower, uh, molten salt storage, storage tanks. And uh, well, this uh, <coughs> this was a demonstration plant we built in the 1981, uh, but it's still operating as uh, R&D facility, or it's a test facility. Now we can see again this uh, plant at Pasto, at, the, Calif at uh, the Mojave Desert in California, uh, which is a surrounding field, as you can clearly see. The tower is placed more or less in the center of the field, and the heliostats are arranged in circles around the tower. Um, in this uh, in this image from Google Earth, you can find it in Google Earth if you have if you look near Barstow, in California. Uh, we can see the heliostats. We can see that there are more to the north of the tower than to the south of the tower. Is just because of uh, optimizing the performance of the concentrator system. Uh, I'm talking about the performance, about the optical performance of heliostats. In fact, this is a qu quite a complex problem because, because uh, well, the sun moves uh, during the day. Yeah? <laughs> if we if we are if, um, if we observe the sun, we can uh, see how it moves during the day, and this uh, movement changes during the year. In the position of the sun depends on the time of, of the year, and you have to calculate the position of your heliostat to uh, reflect the sun rays on the on the tower. Uh, from point of view of the geometrical performance, the ideal situation is to have an incidence angle that is the angle that uh, the angle formed by the normal to the surface and the sun ray incidence angle close to zero, or at least minimum. Uh, so it's an optimization problem to uh, <coughs> to uh, arrange the heliostats and uh, size uh, tower so that you get a minimum average uh, incidence angle for all the heliostats during the year. 
that's normally uh, that's normally accounted for in what we call it the cosine factor. This, uh, this slide we can see uh, simulation the cosine factor for a certain plant similar to PS10 and we can see that the cosine factor the optical performance of this uh, field is better for the heliostats it's better for the heliostats which are close closer to the tower and placed more or less north of the tower and it is worse for the heliostats which are placed farther from the tower and um, and are closer closer to the to the east or west or the, of the tower uh, in fact uh, this is not uh, always like this it depends on how you <coughs> on how you optimize your system uh, there's always a compromise between different factors like uh, costs and optical performance for example the higher you make the the higher you build the tower, the cost will be larger. Perhaps you get an advantage in terms of uh, performance. Other things that you have to consider uh, is uh, when you analyze the performance of a uh, concentrator system of heliostat field is the reflectivity of the mirrors. The reflectivity of uh, the glass mirrors, of the conventional solar glass mirrors is close to 94% for new mirrors and it, it must be <coughs> a good reflectivity in all the <coughs> range of uh, wavelengths of the solar radiation. In this case, for example, we see a test of, uh, of a mirror, of a solar mirror, and we can see that the reflectivity is the blur curve uh, is uh, <coughs> quite high for all the more or less for all the wavelengths of the for the of the solar spectrum which uh, we can see in the yellow curve <coughs> then the heliostats uh, <coughs> have to be placed so that the shading and blocking between them is not significant or at least is uh, controlled uh, of course you can minimize the shading and blocking by separating more the heliostats but uh, you will need more land and the cost will be uh, will be larger so uh, again it's an optimization problem to determine or to arrange the heliostats in the best possible way you can see here the effect of the shadows of one heliostat heliostat projects a shadow on the on a neighbor heliostat and blockings where one uh, the radiation reflected by one heliostat is blocked by a heliostat which is placed in front of it again we can see the simulation or the calculation of the shading blocking factor for a certain heliostat field as you can see in this case, in this case, the shading blocking factor is uh, worse. Is worse for uh, heliostats placed closer, close to the tower. But uh, well, depends on, always on how you optimize it. Atmospheric attenuation. Well, there's nothing here. <laughs> uh, it's probably because it's uh, passed to PDF, it's converted to PDF. But well, it's uh, only uh, the, atmospheric, the atmospheric attenuation is the effect of, uh, <coughs> of the interaction of the concentrated solar radiation with the atmospheric components in, in the way from the heliostat to the receiver. It, uh, it's normally in the range of uh, 5% for a typical heliostat field um, and for um, for normal atmospheric conditions of course there are days where you have uh, much uh, for example in hazy, hazy days you have a much larger attenuation in the field finally all the 
concentrated, the solar radiation reflected and concentrated by the heliostat field <coughs> um, goes to the receiver. But uh, because of different factors, which uh, we don't have time to talk about uh, about here, uh, <coughs> different factors, not all the concentrated solar radiation hits the absorber, the absorber surface of the receiver. Part of it may fall out of the absorber, like we can see in this picture. We can see that part of the concentrated solar radiation hits the surroundings of the receiver, of the aperture in this case, because this is what we will call cavity receiver. And um, <coughs> of course, these are losses. This is energy. This is uh, power that you are that you are that you cannot use. So you normally uh, you should try to minimize this spillage. On the other hand, it's uh, quite uh, it's quite complicated, perhaps uh, to explain in a few minutes. But on the other hand, uh, you cannot concentrate all the uh, all the solar radiation on. I mean, the absorber the absorber can only stand certain peak, peak flux. So uh, in some cases you need to to develop an aiming strategy that results uh, that results in an increased spillage. This is uh, again something to be contemplated very carefully in the design of the of the system. We have now the <coughs> The receiver, all this uh, concentrated solar radiation that hits the receiver, has to be converted or transformed into thermal power. And uh, normally, it's uh, in the it's a uh, as an increase of enthalpy of the of a working fluid. This receiver is mounted on a tower, except in a very special cases uh, that we again we don't have time to talk about them here, but. Uh, there are some configurations where the receiver may be placed uh, at the bottom of the tower or, uh, or in other, other place. Can be there, there can be a cavity too, a cavity where <coughs> that uh, uh, li uh, limits the thermal and radi radiative, radiative losses of the receiver. The absorber itself, this is uh, the main element of the receiver, is where the uh, concentrated solar radiation is transformed into thermal energy, supporting structure, of course, and maybe other auxiliary elements like uh, steam drum for steam receivers, recirculation pumps, etc. <coughs> and there are many, many types of uh, receivers. Uh, the main types are external tubular receivers, like the one we can see, like in this drawing. Uh, tubular cavity receivers, where the absorber is placed inside the cavity to reduce the losses, mainly, and also to homogenize the flux distribution of, on the absorber. We can also have volumetric receivers, which are receivers where the absorption of the solar radiation doesn't take place on the surface, but on in a volume, mm -hmm. in a volume, uh, so that uh, again the radiation losses can be limited. And uh, there are other types of receivers under experimentation, like for example the fluidized bed uh, or solid particle receivers. In these pictures, we can see two cavity receivers. The first one is the cavity receiver of the uh, of the CRS plant of, at Plataforma Solar de Almería. This was the first uh, sodium receiver uh, manufactured by Sulzer, by the Swiss company Sulzer. And this is a picture of the cavity of PS10 in Spain when it was still being built, as you can probably uh, as you can see. This is a picture of a test uh, molten salt receiver 
at uh, San Diego National Labs in the United States. Uh, here you can, <coughs> perhaps you, it's easy to imagine the size of these uh, receivers, so only 4.5 4 megawatts thermal. And uh, if you consider that PS10 is almost 10 times uh, this thermal power, uh, you can imagine what are the dimensions of uh, these receivers inside the cavity. Uh, this is again a uh, molten salt receiver, a tubular molten salt receiver. And uh, these are pictures of uh, Solar 2, one of the, well, the last project that uh, was developed in, at the Barstow Central Receiver plant, uh, which was a molten salt uh, tubular receiver. Here we can see some pictures, a picture of the mounting of the panels and uh, a drawing uh, of, the, of this uh, receiver. We have talked about uh, steam receivers and molten salt receivers. These are not the only fluids that have been used or proposed for central receiver systems. Air has been also proposed, especially for volumetric receivers also for pressurized tubular receivers. The main advantage or the main attractive of using air is that if you can go to high temperatures and high pressure, then you can <coughs> you can use a Python cycle instead of a Rankine cycle and increase the efficiency of the whole system. At the moment, there are no commercial uh, there are no real commercial plants with uh, air receivers. But uh, there have been many pilot tests, and it's probably a candidate for future developments. The water steam receiver is uh, perhaps uh, it has the main advantage that you use the same fluid in the receiver and uh, in the power cycle, Rankine cycle. Uh, so you eliminate the need for steam generators and uh, heat exchangers in general. With the molten salt receivers, the main advantage is that uh, the same fluid, molten salts, can be used at the receiver and at the thermal storage system. We will talk about thermal storage uh, next uh, in the next session, but uh, well, just to give an idea. The, the amount of, uh, of molten salts that you need for a thermal storage system in a central receiver plant uh, operating at 550 degrees C, it's uh, roughly one third of the amount of salts you need for the same thermal storage capacity in a parabolic trough plant with, uh, uh, with the current technology. Finally, there have been also experiences with uh, sodium. Sodium is an excellent thermal fluid, but as you probably, all of you probably know, it's a dangerous fluid because uh, it burns in contact with the air and it's uh, explosive uh, when enters in contact with uh, water. Sodium was used at the central receiver um, system of Plataforma Soar de Almería in the SSPS project. Uh, well, um, finally I will comment a little bit on the commercial plants which are already operating or are being built in Spain and uh, two, uh, I would call them demonstration or pilot size plants uh, with uh, new concepts that, uh, well, one of them is uh, in the United States, in California, the other, the other one in Israel. First of all, um, we can, this is a drawing of the uh, diagram of the PS10 and the uh, PS10 uh, plant at uh, San Luca la Mayor near Seville in Spain. Uh, there are two similar plants operating in the same site. Uh, we will see immediately a picture. We can see here that the heliostats concentrate their solar radiation. Heliostats concentrate the solar radiation on the solar receiver, uh, on the receiver. 
the receiver evaporates water. This is a saturated steam receiver. Uh, steam and uh, liquid, liquid water are separated in a steam drum and uh, the steam is uh, <coughs> expanded in a steam turbine generating nominal conditions 11 megawatts of power. Uh, part of the, if there is excess in thermal energy, this excess in thermal energy uh, can be uh, can be delivered to thermal storage. This uh, thermal storage it uh, consists of a series of, uh, of uh, pressurized water tanks. Uh, it's a small size uh, thermal storage. It gives for 50 minutes at 50% uh, load operation, but it's enough to <coughs> to to provide the stability in the case of short transients. This plant, in addition, has a backup fossil fuel uh, <coughs> bo uh, burner, hmm? which, uh, well, in the Spanish uh, regulation, can use up to 15% of natural gas or other fuel uh, of the general, of the yearly production hmm? for different uses, mainly to maintain the temperature of the storage fluid but it can also be used can also be used for other purposes these are pictures of uh, ps10 and ps20 this one on the right side is uh, ps10 the megawatt plant and this is ps20 these are other pictures of uh, these plants um, it's not easy to see the storage tanks and so on, but uh, well, here you can even see a small uh, R&D installation. And this uh, nice picture of the PS20, I think, uh, tower with uh, the sun rays uh, <coughs> produced by the heliostats focusing on the receiver of the tower, which is on the other side, of course. There's another, these are the only two plants operating in Spain currently. Uh, there's another one build, being built, is the project Gema Solar. It's a 17 uh, megawatt um, central receiver plant, 17 megawatt electric, with 15 hours of uh, thermal storage capacity at, uh, <coughs> at uh, nominal power. So it's, it has a very large, um, very large thermal storage in molten salts, and uh, <coughs> and because uh, this storage is so large, the heliostat field is very uh, oversized, to, uh, comparison to the to the nominal to the rated power of the plant. Again, we have the heliostat field that concentrates solar radiation on the molten salt receiver. The molten salt is heated from roughly 300 290 degrees C to 560 C degrees C. This uh, molten salt is uh, <coughs> sent to the hot uh, to the hot tank to the hot salt storage tank, and uh, <coughs> this is the process of charging. Uh, storage and when you wish to use the energy stored in the tank you uh, <coughs> make it circulate uh, make the hot salt circulate through a set of uh, heat exchangers steam generators uh, the hot the cold uh, salt is sent to a cold storage tank and uh, the steam is used to 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 move a turbine or just to feed a turbine and generate electricity. Uh, this plant is uh, currently being built. Here we can see a picture of the tower which is being built. It's a very high, very tall tower. I don't remember exactly what is the height. I think we can see it right now. And these are drawings of what uh, the plant will be in the future. As you can see, the heliostat field will be really large with uh, many heliostats. In fact, 
uh, nearly 200, uh, excuse me, 2,500 heliostats with a total reflective area of 285,000 uh, square meters. Uh, the tower height is uh, more than 120 meters, I don't remember exactly, I think this data is probably from old design, I think it's, uh, it's, more, it's higher. And the uh, thermal output of the receiver is 120 megawatts thermal. Part of this uh, thermal power is delivered to the this uh, the whole uh, excuse me the whole thermal power is delivered to the thermal storage and from the thermal storage you can run the steam turbine which has uh, 70 megawatt electric capacity. Well, just to summarize. Uh, well, I, I will go back now to this. I will show first two more pictures. One of them is of the small uh, plant uh, <coughs> built by eSolar in the United States, in California. It's the Sierra Solar plant, which is a modular concept with uh, concept with uh, small size heliostats. See here the heliostats, uh, and uh, this heliostats heliostats concentrate solar radiation on a tower. This tower is a very modular tower. In fact, the pedestal or it's made, uh, it's like the pedestals of the wind turbines, similar to them. And uh, <coughs> this concept uh, is uh, oriented to modular, to modular plants with uh, several modules of, uh, if I don't remember, I remember well of uh, one megawatt electrical each, and this is another concept of a uh, 100 kilowatt hybrid gas turbine plant with a set of small heliostats. Also, you can see here the small heliostats. Here you have the tower with the receiver and the gas turbine on top of the tower. Here you can see a drawing showing that you can. Uh, you can organize a few uh, of these uh, systems, of these modular systems, in a uh, football uh, stadium. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, more oriented, this concept is more oriented to distributed generation, which is a very interesting concept. This is, uh, to my knowledge, the only system which uh, is being proposed. Uh, for commercial projects that uses a uh, gas turbine. It has been developed by the Israeli company Aura Solar. And uh, finally, I will finish this uh, overview of the central receiver system which, uh, with um, the consideration of the pros and contras of, the, of these systems. The main attractive of uh, central receiver systems is their ability to achieve high temperatures, high concentrations and high temperatures with uh, high efficiency. Another uh, interesting fact is that there is a wide industrial base for most components. Uh, there's, there are not very specialized components like in the case of uh, parabolic troughs. Uh, most of them can be designed or engineered by, by any uh, company with uh, sufficient expertise. There are many technological options. That's uh, an attractive, but it's also at the moment uh, somehow a problem because there's no, no leading or hegemonic technology in this field. There are many options and uh, it's not clear which of them is the best. It's technologically proven in demonstration plans and since uh, two or three years ago, more than two years ago, commercial operation with PS10 and PS20 a little bit later, there are multiple thermal storage options and uh, these types of systems have a great potential for improved efficiency or cost reduction. As, uh, <coughs> as uh, also to these uh, pros, there are some cons. Uh, first of, uh, of all, complexity. These systems are more complex, of course, the parabolic traps. Um, there is a short commercial record uh, for these types of plants. In fact, 
the only commercial record is that of uh, PS10 and PS20 at the moment. Uh, probably it will be better in the future. That makes it uh, sometimes difficult to get the projects financed by banks. And, uh, well, this is a question. Is, is it still immature? Uh, I'm not sure whether it is or not. We have uh, many options that we know that, uh, that work, but uh, at the moment we don't know uh, which of them work is the best. And uh, something important, um, we don't know the costs. Probably for PS10 or PS20, the costs are in the range, in the same range of the costs of uh, parabolic traps, but uh, it's difficult to know because companies are normally reluctant to give these types, of, this type of information. And um, <coughs> well. Um, the heliostat cost of the heliostat of the heliostat field is uh, the larger fraction, nearly 60% of the whole cost. But uh, as I said, it's uh, difficult to give precise number regard numbers or figures regarding costs. Well, I will pass now to parabolic dishes to the second part of this presentation. It, I hope not to. <coughs> to take too much time, but uh, what, I'll try to give an overview of these systems. Parabolic dishes, uh, as we will see, are very attractive. It's a very clear and clean concept. It's a parabolic concentrator, uh, like uh, the antennas, for example, we used for communications, for television and so on, uh, that concentrate the uh, solar radiation in the focus, and then on the focus, you we have to place a system that converts the concentrated solar radiation into thermal energy. We can see here a picture of uh, the only plant which is operating uh, now as a real plant in the world, to my knowledge. This, this is a plant uh, in, the <coughs> uh, in Arizona, Maricopa and it's made of uh, 60 units of uh, 25 kilowatt each. Uh, that makes 1.5 megawatts. This plant was, uh, <coughs> was recently uh, inaugurated and uh, well, we have uh, many expectations on this technology. Well, as I said, these uh, systems combine a parabolic concentrator with a power conversion unit power conversion unit basically converts solar radiation to electricity. Uh, there are different components inside this unit. And uh, this power conversion unit is directly attached to the concentrator. Uh, there are different types of uh, possible power conversion units, those based on gas turbines or power conversion unit for direct steam generation. But uh, the most attractive option at the moment, and uh, say the state of the art, uh, is are based on stealing engines. Stealing engines are, are uh, thermal engines of uh, high efficiency. We will talk a little bit about them in a few minutes. Here we can see a picture of one of the first uh, parabolic dish installations in the world. It was the solar village in. Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is uh, was operating from 1983 to 1988. Uh, the dishes had a diameter of 17 meters, and the stealing engines were 50 kilowatt each, manufactured by the Swedish company United Stirling. I think it was Swedish. I'm not quite sure. United Stirling company. Uh, <coughs> Here we can see uh, another picture of a uh, direct steam generation facility at Shenandoah in Georgia, in the United States. Uh, this facility was used to generate or to produce industrial process heat. Uh, the dishes were much smaller, some meters in diameter, and uh, they used an aluminized film reflector. Uh, the heat from the field was used in a textile plant uh, for air conditioning and process heat. There's a good review of uh, parabolic dishes, uh, although a little bit uh, well, 
uh, outdated. It's uh, from Tom Mancini and other authors. It was published in the Journal of Solar Energy Engineering in 2003. I have uh, included a table of this review here just to show that, uh, well, the main parabolic dish stealing systems uh, which were reviewed here, uh, most of them used uh, used uh, hydrogen as uh, working gas, except one of them that uh, used helium. Uh, they were of different dimensions, but uh, all of them uh, of relatively uh, low power uh, compared to parabolic traps or or central receiver systems between 10 and 25 kilowatts. Uh, between yes, or seven, eight, and twenty-five kilowatts, and uh, they use different types of concentrators and engines. <coughs> and we can see uh, pictures of uh, the Eurodish system. Uh, in fact, this one without the power conversion unit installed, as you can see here, the power conversion unit is missing. Here you can see six uh, parabolic dishes at the Plataforma Sor uh, This is uh, Three of them were the distal systems. These all systems were developed by a German company, SVP, and the uh, uh, stealing engines were manufactured by uh, Solo Klein Motoren, German company too. Uh, as I said, this installation is at Plataforma Sor uh, This was a uh, is a test uh, installation, and uh, we, uh, they have accumulated many hours, many many hours of operation in this installation, trying to trying to improve the technology. We can see in this uh, scheme the main elements of uh, dish for all these stealing systems. Uh, all these systems have some kind of supporting structure. Hmm? In this case, we can see here a carousel type structure, but there are other mounted on pedestals, and even new concepts are appearing. Uh, the appearing the ground, and uh, well, this uh, structure supports concentrator. The concentrator uh, <coughs> concentrator, of course, is uh, one of the most uh, important elements of these systems, it's a parabolic concentrator. We need also a tracking system so that the, that the sun rays are, or the, so that the optical axis of the, of the concentrator is always aligned with the sun rays to get maximum efficiency. Then we have a, a power conversion unit, power conversion unit placed on the focus, and uh, some control system. Uh, we can see here different types of uh, optical surfaces, structural optical surfaces, where <coughs> where the optical surface plays some um, structural role, uh, space frame structures, stretched membrane again, uh, concentrators. In this case, the stretched membrane concentrators have a, have to have special uh, features. Uh, glass mirror uh, faceted concentrators, in this case made of uh, glass mirror facets, all attached to supporting structure, to space frame. And <coughs> these uh, glass mirrors have to be curved mirrors, normally with uh, spherical curvature, and uh, must be aligned individually. Uh, the whole concentrator must have a parabolic shape that makes it a little bit complex. You can see here some pictures of uh, full surface paraboloids where the entire surface forms a paraboloid and uh, in many cases they are made of uh, petals like uh, as we can see in this uh, picture or uh, stretched membranes concentrators like uh, very similar to the heliostats the only difference is that the Focal length now is much shorter. Uh, <coughs> the curvature must be bigger, and uh, the vacuum is not enough to to get 
the optical the necessary optical shape so there must be a pre-shaping previous to the mounting of them of the concentrator the reflective surface is normally made of uh, of uh, an acrylic silver acrylic uh, film or uh, or another possibility is to attach thin glass mirrors to the membrane um, <coughs> finally uh, in an attempt to avoid the need for pre-shaping uh, some uh, there have been some developments to <coughs> oriented to multifaceted uh, stretched membranes uh, concentrators uh, the main problem is that the alignment is difficult and the optical behavior is not as good as, uh, as other solutions that we have seen before regarding the tracking uh, there can be two types of mounting polar mounting where the tracking takes place uh, around the polar axis and uh, elevation azimuth tracking which is uh, the, I would say the conventional solution for most uh, parabolic dish systems at the moment uh, the concentrator concentrates the solar radiation on the receiver the receiver is normally placed is normally placed uh, inside a cavity the reason for the reasons for the cavity are to reduce the thermal losses so especially the radiation thermal losses but also the convection thermal losses from the absorber uh, and to homogenize the flux because uh, if we had very high peak fluxes on the absorber the material the material of the receiver would probably be damaged or destroyed so there's need to homogenize the flux to make it a little bit more homogeneous um, most of the receivers are cavity receivers but there can also be uh, external receivers for lower temperatures normally and there are two main types of receivers directly illuminated tubes DIR directly limited receivers and reflux receivers here we can see a picture of a <coughs> DIR uh, of a directly limited tube receiver this is the receiver of the of the Eurodish the Eurodish system which is uh, mounted on the 10 kilowatt stealing engine and here we can see some drawings and pictures of uh, reflux receivers reflux receivers use an intermediate heat transfer fluid to the couple receiver and engine and there are two main types of uh, reflux receivers pool volume receivers the one we see in the picture and heat pipes these heat pipes there's a wick that draws the liquid metal from a small sump this liquid metal uses to be it's normally sodium which uh, as I said before have uh, has a very has very good uh, thermal properties and since the amount of sodium used is not uh, very significant uh, possible risks of using sodium are very limited uh, the receiver transforms uh, the concentrated solar radiation into thermal energy the thermal energy is used uh, in the stealing cycle to deliver mechanical power stealing cycle is a thermodynamic cycle of high efficiency in fact when using regeneration which is uh, explained somehow in this diagram uh, the theoretical efficiency of this cycle would be close to the efficiency of the Carnot engine it would be the same ideally it would be the same efficiency of the Carnot engine uh, it has two constant the, theory, the, uh, the comparison cycle uh, has two constant volume processes and two constant temperature to its thermal processes and uh, a key element well there are many key elements in this type of engines because it's uh, not perhaps at the moment conventional en engine but uh, a key element in these uh, engines is the regenerator which you can see here and that is uh, partly responsible for the high efficiency of these systems the 
various uh, engines. There are different types of steel engines. Basically, they can be classified into kinematic stealing engines and free piston stealing engine. At the moment, you can see here a drawing of a kinematic stealing engine and here a drawing of a free piston stealing engine. At the moment, uh, of the three systems that are close to be commercial or are commercial at this moment, the two of them used kinematic uh, engines and one of them used a, f use a free piston engine. Well, regarding the state of the art of this technology, we can say that it's uh, at the moment the most efficient uh, so, uh, solar thermal power technology. Uh, the, uh, in fact, the record of uh, solar to electric conversion is, uh, was uh, achieved with, with one of these systems, the sun catcher by SES, by, still, by SES, American company. And uh, it was uh, higher than 30%. It was achieved uh, less than two years ago. There's now some pre-commercial experiences, like, uh, well, the most significant, of course, is the Maricopa solar plant, which, uh, which I commented earlier. And there are also smaller installations in different parts of the world, and some of them made only of one, uh, one single unit. And these pre-commercial experiences are mostly oriented to increase the, the work in these pre-commercial experiences mainly oriented to increase the real, real, reliability of these systems and to reduce costs. If, uh, if uh, these objectives are achieved, uh, systems are really, this uh, concept is really attractive. This is a modular concept, completely modular, that uh, <coughs> but uh, doesn't need uh, water for uh, for cooling. The cooling systems or most of these uh, parabolic these systems is similar to that of the cars with a radiator and uh, closed circuit um, cooling fluid. And uh, well, at the moment, um, to my knowledge, because there might be another some other. Uh, Experiences. There are three main manufacturers or systems today. Uh, first of all, uh, SES, uh, which is uh, connected to Tessera. Uh, the the S, ES system is a 25 kilowatt uh, stealing engine system attached to a concentrator of uh, roughly 10 meters in diameter. Then we have the Eurodish systems. Uh, which was developed by the German company SVP. Now there's a Swedish company that uh, is using, is developing their own system uh, using the solo engine too. And finally, there's a three kilowatt engine with a free piston, three kilowatt system with a free piston engine developed by Infinia in the United States. You can see a picture of the SES of the Tessarasan Catcher. Uh, also, there the web uh, address of this system. Here we have a picture of the still of the Infinia 3 kilowatt free piston uh, system with a free piston engine. And uh, these are some of the characteristics of the Infinia systems. And finally, the Eurodish system, in this case, uh, is, uh, you can see the, <coughs> the power conversion unit on the focus, and so on. This, uh, the Eurodish system was developed by SPP, but uh, as I commented, Clean Energy, the Swedish company, is now developing systems based on the same engine. Finally, again, a uh, picture of the Maricopa Pasoar plant. Uh, regarding commercial projects, there are some projects in Spain, or um, total of probably in the range of uh, 70 megawatt capacity. And there are also big projects in the United States, 
with the total capacity close to 2,000 megawatts. Uh, <coughs> these projects should uh, should start uh, in the near in the near future, uh, probably in one or two years, I hope. And uh, well, as I mentioned, it's a very promising uh, concept. Uh, regarding costs, it's difficult to say. It's difficult to say. It's uh, the cost uh, per per kilowatt installed, kilowatt capacity is uh, probably higher at this moment than that for photovoltaics, but uh, it's being it's being reduced very sharply with the last uh, developments and uh, what we can expect in near future to have a to have some of uh, these systems playing uh, important role in the energy the electricity market especially okay very well thank you very much manuel again very very interesting presentation today in solar parks so we thank you very much are going to proceed to some uh, questions so uh, from now you can submit your your questions through the q a window and uh, we will be um, selecting some of them uh, there will be many, so uh, we will try to go across some, some of them, or at least the most uh, representative ones. So, um, let me go across some of them. One moment, please. Yeah, well, one question in the meanwhile, uh, whether there are plans for uh, installing CSP plants or CRS systems in Mexico? Are you aware of uh, developments in uh, Mexico or Latin America in general? Thank you, Manuel. Mm. Uh, well, to my knowledge, there are no no commercial projects going on at the moment. Uh, I know that there is a lot of interest in Chile and in Mexico about uh, CSP. Uh, I don't have uh, any information about uh, CRS projects. They are most of them are based on parabolic clubs, but uh, there could be there could be. But uh, but in any case, uh, they would be at the moment. Uh, okay, good. Pilot plans. So another uh, question not, about uh, cleaning not, the mirrors for. Um, as far as I know. Well, I suppose heliostat systems, uh, but also the parabolic dish systems. Uh, is there any particular proceeding? Thank you. Uh, well, for heliostats, uh, there's there are some proceedings. In fact, uh, for example, at the at uh, the plants in Sevilla, uh, PS and PS20, they have developed uh, some type of uh, cleaning vehicle with uh, uh, I don't know the, the English word for it's a system similar to that used uh, for cleaning for the car cleaning tunnels. With uh, rolls, it's the word. I'm not sure uh, that uh, what they used to clean the mirrors were with some water. Uh, for parabolic traps, uh, at the moment I don't know of any uh, specialized uh, system for cleaning. But uh, of course, that will be there will be a need. There is a need for such kind of uh, cleaning systems. Probably with uh, high pressure, uh, with high pressure okay, water. Okay, good. Thank you, Manuel. 
But um, uh, another question on the costs. Uh, well, it's uh, difficult to say to which are the declared costs of the current operating plant CSP in terms of uh, euros per kilowatt. Well, there is investment, there is. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It's a. Uh, yes, it's difficult. It's difficult to to answer to this question. Uh, it's um, it's difficult because of many reasons. One of them is that uh, many many CSP plants, well, most of them are parabolic graph plants. So almost all the figures are referred to to these parabolic graph plants, and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, something that makes it uh, difficult to give this figure is that uh, many of them have a uh, thermal storage. So the solar field is oversized uh, compared to the rated capacity, uh, and you have to take that into account. Uh, the solar multiple is the the parameter is uh, much larger than one, close to two in many in many of the commercial plants. Uh, probably for a plant without thermal storage we would be this figure would be between 3 and uh, between 3000 and 4000 euros per kilowatt at the moment uh, that's in spain uh, there are many factors that uh, make it difficult to to know it and uh, to know if that uh, if those uh, figures are realistic or can be extrapolated to to other, to other parts of the world like for example the support in terms of tariffs that uh, exists in spain that uh, is probably what well, this support or this tariff will be probably decreased uh, reduced in the next years and uh, the cost will probably good will thank probably you very much well, um, next uh, question but, uh, you have mentioned about the lifetime around, uh, of between 3 and 4000 euros per thank kilowatt you. well for heliostats uh, lifetime can be close to the lifetime of the plant uh, i mean uh, a good mirror a good mirror uh, with uh, appropriate um, coatings uh, can last nearly 20 or 25 years uh, so of course uh, not all mirrors are good some of them uh, some of them can can suffer a very fast uh, degradation but uh, that's a matter of selecting selecting good mirrors and uh, well, uh, for example in Plataforma Suar Maria has been operating now for more than 25 years is um, it's a test facility now but uh, well, the Heliostats field had been operating for this whole time and uh, to my knowledge the mirrors have been uh, replaced uh, only once and I have to say that the first uh, mirrors or the first reflectors which were a bit different from the Good. current Thank you, Manuel. Uh, concept Next question, uh, what is the solar to electricity the efficiency and, uh, of ES10? The uh, new ones uh, are performing much better uh, that Thank you <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, something that uh, Avengo Solar will <laughs> probably know. Uh, well, it must be close to 15%. PSTM, uh, we don't have much time to, to, to go deep on these uh, aspects, but PSTM is uh, very. Uh, it's not, not a typical. Uh, central receiver system because uh, temperature the operating temperature is quite low it's quite low 
uh, it uses a um, saturated steam turbine so the efficiency of the power conversion cycle is uh, essentially low but uh, in any case it must be close to 15 percent i think but uh, i don't know the real the real number the real efficiency of uh, ps10 because uh, okay that's something in this that, case uh, we will Avengo try to Solar do a webinar uh, with Avengo Solar. <laughs> thank you probably nobody else with so uh, Next question, um, coming back on costs, uh, do you have any reference for uh, Sterling Dish Engine bar, mm -hmm. uh, plants? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it's again difficult to say. Um, it's difficult to say because uh, if you try to buy a single, single uh, dish stealing engine, you will probably get. Uh, if you get a quote, the price will be quite high. But uh, for larger projects with uh, several tens or hundreds or thousands of uh, of dish stealing systems. Uh, I think the objective is to be in the range of the, the objectives of the manufacturers to be in the range of the three to four uh, thousand euros per kilowatt, but uh, that's an objective. Not uh, it's not the current cost, which is difficult to say. They, they are not uh, at the moment. Okay, very well. What we can very soon. Um, add to this uh, answer um, is the but, fact uh, that in the current uh, uh, fitting moment. tariff scheme in Spain is roughly 30 euro cents per kilowatt hour uh, we find some uh, parabolic uh, still in dish uh, power plants not much power installed but uh, well, I think in Puerto Llano maybe you have more information there are some tens of megawatts so it means that um, the levelized cost of energy uh, remains within these 30 euro cents per kilowatt hour under the irradiation conditions of, of Spain, which is um, somewhere uh, an answer. Um, I don't know if you have uh, additional elements on this, uh, Manuel. No, yes, I, I know that uh, there are some developers interested to well in fact there are all, already uh, some uh, 70 megawatts uh, pre-assigned in the current uh, in the current uh, Spanish uh, market for parabolic dishes and uh, yes so the I would say that the at least the expectations of the developers are that the levelized electricity cost must be lower than this uh, than this uh, premium so well, but uh, again uh, at the moment uh, there's there are only a few few units installed in in Spain not uh, not planned okay Probably Manuel two just to uh, more about this, this one or two uh, discussion years. on costs uh, uh, cost technology uh, difficult to, uh, to be we more know that um, the mainstream is parabolic trough because it's proven uh, efficiency and bankability. Uh, but we know also that this uh, central receiver uh, technology, uh, parabolic dish, is uh, promis uh, pr promising in terms of um, efficiency and well, going beyond the temperatures and investment costs. So, is there any um, location for innovation or any uh, room for programs uh, to um, dedicate uh, budgets uh, to innovative funds? Thank you. Yeah, to, to innovative concepts. Uh, so, beyond the feeding tariff. Uh, scheme, is there any possibility for these new Sorry, and emerging technologies to find finance? To in 
बोल रहे Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure there's uh, room for that. Uh, well, the Spanish market uh, has very special characteristics, uh, and uh, well, more than 90% of the installed capacity will be uh, with uh, parabolic trough plants. But, uh, for example, in the North American market, uh, if you look at the projects at the moment, they are only most of them are only projects, but you can you can observe uh, much uh, uh, it's more uh, uh, more open uh, panorama. You can see that there are projects with uh, parabolic troughs, of course, but also many projects with uh, central receiver systems. Uh, many projects and very important projects with parabolic dishes and uh, even some uh, projects projects with uh, linear Fresnel reflectors so I would say that at the moment there's no clear uh, no clear winner there's a lot of room for innovation uh, we are trying in Spain or some of us are trying to to promote uh, or to, to support the idea that the, that the administration should support innovation uh, with different uh, schemes and uh, I hope to see okay, good. Uh, so a lot of new developments close to the end in of the all the different technologies today. during, during the next year. One question referring to education on CSP, so Alias Safesh is uh, asking, is looking for an internship in CSP. As a student of Jurek Master, would you recommend a company or research center? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, a uh, company, of course, uh, any of the leading companies uh, in Spain, Avengoa Solar or Sener or um, uh, ACS, uh, any of the leading companies in the market. There are also some smaller companies which uh, have very inter interesting technological concepts, depends on the orientation you wish for your career. And regarding research centers in, in Europe, I would say that Plataforma Sor de Almería is, uh, without question, the most interesting uh, research center. Perhaps uh, well, the CNRS, the French, uh, French uh, research uh, uh, institution, uh, has also very interesting installations in the French Pyrenees. And uh, the German DLR also has, uh, well, many of their activities take place in Spain, but uh, they have also some facilities in Germany. And, uh, they are also at a very high level. So uh, any of these, I would say it's, it would be very good. There are other options, but uh, well, <laughs> it's difficult to to remember now all of them. Uh, but yes, I hope this, uh, this is okay, <laughs> enough this, um, <laughs> at the moment. If not, you, you can contact me or anybody interested in that. This. Can contact me and I will try to give some orientation. Uh, so possible. probably the last question, what special measures of uh, operation and maintenance of dishes required compared to traps? Can they exceed 25 years of service? What is expected to fail first during their useful life? Thank you. Well, it's uh, parabolic dishes are very different from troughs. Very different from troughs. Uh, regarding operation maintenance, uh, we have a uh, one uh, parabolic dish uh, system at uh, our engineering school here in Seville, and uh, we have been operating it for a few years. We have observed a number of. Um, <coughs> 
of uh, issues regarding operation maintenance for these systems that uh, probably uh, that have been probably improved but uh, for example the stealing engines requires uh, service with different level of uh, depth uh, every certain numbers number number of uh, operating hours especially this is true for kinematic stealing stealing engine if they operate with uh, hydrogen um, there will be leaks and uh, you have, will have to to refill uh, the the hydrogen uh, bottles or <coughs> yes or, and um, what other things uh, these are perhaps the most specific things of uh, parabolic dishes. Uh, here um, opposition you don't have any you don't have uh, pumps like uh, oil pumps like in parabolic that fills uh, you don't have a uh, large uh, ducts of, uh, with uh, oil in flowing through them so well uh, it's it's very it's re really different it's really different but the most specific uh, feature of uh, of parabolic dishes uh, no doubt the engine the stealing engine uh, can they exceed 25 years of service well, i think uh, i'm not sure i'm not sure at the moment with the stealing engines i don't know what are the plans of the manufacturers at this moment or or the specifications of the manufacturers at this moment um, <coughs> you have here an engine a reciprocating engine and uh, as i said it needs service every certain numbers of year every certain certain number of hours and uh, probably if it's uh, properly uh, maintained uh, they can they can be they can be uh, Operating for for large for a few years, but I don't know how many at the at the moment. Uh, probably the fails during the, the the first thing that could fail during the useful life could be the the engine again, or the receiver. The receiver, if the concentrator doesn't work properly, then you could have a damage on the on the receiver. But uh, well, that would be relatively easy to to avoid if uh, if the right uh, well, measures Thank are you very much, Manuel. So, um, last question: the Which of, of the CSG technologies good, has, I in your view, the highest will potential be good for to become cheapest? One. I th I'm sure there is no answer for this, but uh, what's your yeah. feeling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, it's it's very difficult again. Uh, in terms of uh, of Europe, of uh, yes, in terms of uh, energy cost, in terms of uh, energy cost, I would say that uh, in the mid term, uh, some central receiver technology will probably have will probably uh, have a very cheap. Uh, or cheaper, the cheapest uh, electricity cost. Um, <clears throat> if we look uh, further in the future, cost will be probably associated to efficiency, of course, uh, also to to the costs of materials. But the materials are very similar in all these technology or the basic materials, and uh, probably. Parabolic dishes would uh, be winners in the long, in the long term, but uh, well, that uh, depends on many factors, and um, uh, perhaps not. Uh, what I said the last, uh, the last I said is probably not true, but uh, you don't have to take only into account the cost. The modularity plays an important role. 
and I'm convinced that the energy system in the future will uh, will need of uh, modular systems. It will be more distributed, uh, and I think uh, parallel dishes will be very very attractive. But uh, different concepts of uh, central receiver systems or even parabolic troughs. Uh, uh, that I'm sure that. Uh, these concepts will uh, indeed so not only cost evolve, but modularity and uh, of course also we'll probably have a place as we will see it's difficult in to the next say. session yeah. yeah great okay thank you very much manuel so here we adjourn thank you to the audience to be here um, yes of course once again yes in next and session and now yes. uh, manuel i give you the floor to say goodbye and to the next session thank you